This is an overview of the meeting of creditors for individual debtors who file a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy petition in the Northern District of West Virginia. Every individual debtor filing a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy petition must attend his or her meeting of creditors. If spouses filed a joint petition, both spouses must attend. The meeting is conducted with a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy trustee who is selected by the United States Department of Justice. The purpose of the meeting, among other things, is to verify a debtor's identity and to acquire about a debtor's assets and liabilities. The meeting is not conducted by a bankruptcy judge, and the bankruptcy judge is prohibited from attending the meeting. I'm Helen Morris. I'm the Chapter 13 trustee uh, for the Northern and Southern Districts of West Virginia, and my office is located in South Charleston, West Virginia. My name is Aaron Amore. I'm a uh, Chapter 7 panel trustee. Uh, I typically hear cases in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, my law firm is Amore Law, PLLC. I'm located at 206 West Liberty Street in Charlestown, West Virginia. This is Thomas Herbert Fliharty. I'm located at Clarksburg, West Virginia. I'm a Chapter 7 trustee in both the Northern and Southern Districts of West Virginia. Hi, my name is Martin Patrick Sheehan. I am one of the Chapter 7 panel trustees in the Northern District of West Virginia. A Chapter 7 meeting of creditors must be scheduled between 21 and 40 days after the filing of a voluntary bankruptcy petition. In a Chapter 13 case, the meeting of creditors must be scheduled between 21 and 50 days after the filing of the bankruptcy petition. A failure to file all the required schedules with the petition will not delay a date first set for the meeting of creditors, but it may cause the meeting to be called and continued to another date. In advance of the meeting of creditors, the case trustee may request certain financial information. That information will vary depending on the facts of a particular case. Typically, we're going to require two years worth of tax returns. We're going to need pay advices, and normally the debtors provide those to their attorneys beforehand if they are employed. We will also need post-petition pay advices, those pay advices after the filing of the petition. Uh, we also require bank statements. Uh, if there is a business, we require profit and loss statements, and we also require uh, statements of any insurance policies, any accounts such as retirement accounts, uh, stocks, bonds, and things like that. Here are ways to submit these documents to them. With respect to the tax returns, we have a special email box, tax returns, one word, at wvtrustee.org and the attorneys can submit those to us through that email address. They can also mail them to us, although I don't prefer that. The pay stubs and bank statements can also be sent to that same email address, or as I said, they can be brought to the meeting of creditors. Well, normally the debtors submit them to their attorneys, and their attorneys upload them through something called Blue Stylus. Uh, unfortunately, it is not available for debtors directly. Uh, it is only available to their attorneys and the trustee. Uh, if we have a pro se debtor, uh, my office reaches out to the debtor usually in the form of a call if we have a number or a letter, uh, and we advise the uh, debtors uh, what documents are required and how best to provide them to us. The tax return, they can submit that on doc links if they would like to. So if they want to uh, mail those to me, they can do that as well. And those are due seven days prior to the creditors' meetings. Uh, the uh, pay advices from the time of the filing up to the 341 meeting and the bank statement should simply be brought to the 341 meeting. If you upload to something called Docklings for them, uh, we will get that information. Uh, you can mail them and we let uh, pro se debtors do that, but it is far more efficient to use the two websites. Uh, if you have any difficulty with those, if you contact uh, the office of the trustee, uh, uh, who is a trustee in your case, uh, we can get you the access codes and get you aligned to do that on a regular basis. At the same time that the debtor submits such information to the trustee, the debtor or debtor's counsel should also notify the case trustee and the United States trustee of any disabilities such as hearing impairment or limited English proficiency so that reasonable accommodation can be made. The location of the meeting is specifically listed for you on the notice for the meeting of creditors. After finding the location for your meeting of creditors and your attorney, wait for your case to be called by the case trustee. Then proceed with your attorney to the case trustee's table and take the oath. 
your statements are made under penalty of perjury and are recorded by the trustee. Only the trustee is permitted to record the proceedings. All other parties and the public are prohibited from recording or taking photographs. After being sworn, provide the trustee with a photo identification that was issued by a governmental unit. Acceptable forms of photo identification include driver's license, U.S. government ID, state ID, passport, military ID, resident alien card, or identity card issued by a national government authority. If you do not have any of the above forms of photo identification, ask the case trustee what form of identification might be acceptable. Be prepared to produce evidence of a social security number or a taxpayer identification number or a statement that no such identification number exists. Acceptable forms of proof of social security number include, but are not limited to, social security card, medical insurance card, pay stub, W-2 form, IRS form 1099, or a social security administration statement. If the petition and schedules have been filed electronically by an attorney, the debtor's attorney must bring the original signatures of the debtor to the meeting and have those available for the trustee's review. Once a debtor has taken the oath, provided proof of identity, and once an attorney has made the debtor's original signatures available to the trustee, then the trustee will ask a series of questions. Some of those questions are asked of all debtors and some are based on the specific information in the debtor's petition and schedules or on the separate information requested by the trustee. Here is a short clip of some trustees going over some typical questions. The first one is, do you own any real estate? And then I follow that up with, uh, what is its value if you sold it today as is? Is the property insured? And if there's secured debt against it, how they're paying for it? I ask the same questions concerning mobile homes and vehicles. One of the things I'm looking for with these questions is to see if the debtor understands their plan. Maybe they don't understand their plan and then I follow up with additional questions about where they're sending the payments, how they're doing that, to clarify for them and for me uh, that who is making payments on these secured claims, whether it's the debtors as direct payments or the trustee. The additional questions that we normally ask uh, really are in relation to the debtor's assets. Uh, any sale of assets in the last four years for land or real property, uh, any gifts to family members, uh, repayments of debt to family or friends uh, is often something we see. Uh, we're going to ask about automobiles, uh, any transfers, repossessions, uh, anything in relating to a real or personal uh, property asset of the debtor, which may be part of the bankruptcy estate. We're also going to ask about uh, any claims that the debtor may have as far as uh, legal claims, either potential claims or claims that they've actually filed, uh, lawsuits which are pending. Uh, oftentimes debtors are unaware of uh, certain class action lawsuits that uh, they may be rolled up to in relation to maybe a, um, a medical device or a drug that's on the market. Uh, the information uh, contained in the debtor's bankruptcy petition and schedules is what we have to go off of when we're asking these questions. Uh, the more accurate and detailed the information is about either an asset or a claim, uh, obviously the easier it makes my job uh, because that information has already been provided. Uh, and if I have to follow up, uh, then I follow up with respect to the questions. There are a, a, a number of required questions uh, or mandatory questions uh, in every bankruptcy case. Uh, and I ask uh, pretty much all of them. Uh, I want them to uh, acknowledge their signature on the petition. I want them to acknowledge that they reviewed the bankruptcy petition uh, prior to signing it, uh, that the documents are fair and accurate, uh, that they are familiar with all of the information in the petition, uh, that they provided that information, and uh, sometimes I'll ask them to, uh, to, to verify assets that haven't been listed or the values have not changed uh, since the, the time of the filing and that the values listed are accurate. There may be a couple of varieties or variations on those questions, but that's that's what I'm getting at. We asked debtors uh, questions about uh, have they lived in the district for two years? This is a question designed to answer um, some venue questions. We asked debtors if they uh, have a domestic support obligation to anyone, require information necessary to fulfill our duties under the code to notify such people. Uh, we ask questions about personal injury cases, uh, other accident claims, 
uh, if people are inheriting things, if they're in other litigation. Uh, I've begun to use a, uh, an additional information sheet to provide information about future cases and future um, uh, and causes of action that, that are a little bit more obscure. Uh, typically we're seeing this as part of the mass tort litigation kinds of things. We'll ask a specific question if you indicate you have an individual retirement account, uh, whether it is originally yours or it's something you have inherited. The Supreme Court has recognized that those are different things and different exemptions apply, so we've pursued that. Uh, and largely, those are, I'd say, the routine questions we ask. And I'll also ask a question about uh, paying off one credit card by using another one. Uh, those are situations that give rise to potential bankruptcy claims. After the trustee has completed the examination, the trustee will inquire if there are any creditors or other parties in interest present who wish to ask questions of the debtor. Historically, in most of the district's routine consumer Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 cases, few creditors make an appearance at the meeting of creditors. When a creditor does appear, those creditors are generally inquiring about a specific asset or examining a debtor with regard to the debtor's good faith in filing bankruptcy. Unlike an appearance in federal court, a business entity may send an individual who is not an attorney to ask the debtor questions. The question is asked of a debtor and the debtor's testimony at a meeting of creditors is similar to a discovery deposition but with some important differences. Primarily, the debtor's testimony is generally not admissible as direct evidence in a later proceeding. However, a debtor's statement may be used in a later proceeding as an admission against interest or for impeachment purposes. A debtor's testimony at the meeting is not governed by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure or the Federal Rules of Evidence. The debtor's attorney may not have much of an opportunity to ask clarifying questions, and a creditor may be denied the opportunity to ask for redirect testimony. If the trustee believes that additional time is necessary for a creditor to examine the debtor, the trustee may terminate the examination and direct the creditor to schedule a further formal examination of the debtor under the Federal Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure. Creditors that desire an audio recording of the meeting of creditors should make a written request to Assistant U.S. Trustee, Room 2025, 300 Virginia Street East, Charleston, West Virginia, 25301, telephone number 304-347-3400. The request should identify the debtor's name, case number, trustee, meeting date, and be accompanied by a blank, factory sealed disk along with a pre-addressed, prepaid envelope in which to ship the disk. If for some reason a debtor cannot attend the date first set for the meeting of creditors, then it is possible to obtain a continuance. Remember, however, that the meeting of creditors is conducted by a private trustee and not the bankruptcy court. Only the appointed trustee or the regional office of the United States trustee can continue the meeting of creditors. Consequently, a request for a continuance should be made to the case trustee in the first instance and, if refused, made to the United States trustee. A request for a continuance should not be made to the bankruptcy judge. If a debtor does not or cannot attend a meeting of creditors, the trustee may file a motion to dismiss the case and at that time the bankruptcy judge may grant the motion or direct that the meeting be rescheduled. A formal continuance of a meeting of creditors can be expensive and burdensome. The notice of the meeting of creditors that is issued by the court is also sent to all creditors listed on the mailing list. A formal continuance requested by a debtor generally requires that the debtor notify all creditors on the mailing list that the request for the continuance was made to the case trustee, that the trustee has consented to the continuance, and the notice must inform the creditors of the rescheduled date. All this information must be mailed by the debtor early enough to provide creditors with sufficient time to receive and process the information in advance of the meeting date. The notice should also be filed with the bankruptcy clerk's office with a certificate of service. Because the process for a formal continuance is expensive and burdensome, a case trustee may agree to call the meeting as originally scheduled and then continue the date on the open record. Creditors attending the meeting are thereby informed of the continued date. The trustee's office then informs the bankruptcy clerk that the meeting was continued and the new date is noted on the debtor's bankruptcy case docket. Consequently, before a creditor travels to attend a meeting of creditors, it is a good idea to contact the trustee's office to ensure that no informal agreements exist to call and continue the meeting. The date first set for the meeting of creditors is an important deadline because many case-related events are based on that date. Some of those deadlines are any objections to venue are due within 21 days. 
an objection to a claim of exemption must be filed within 30 days. An adversary complaint objecting to entry of discharge must be filed within 60 days. An adversary complaint objecting to discharge of a specific debt must be filed within 60 days. Continuing the date first set for the meeting of creditors may not alter these case-related deadlines unless specifically ordered by the court. Consequently, it is very important that a debtor try to attend the meeting when it is first set and not seek to postpone the meeting unless it is absolutely necessary. In general, a debtor is not authorized to attend a meeting of creditors through an individual holding a power of attorney. In extreme cases, the case trustee or the United States trustee may allow an alternative appearance or allow the meeting to be conducted by written interrogatories. If a debtor needs an alternative appearance, the debtor should contact the case trustee in the first instance. The contact information for the trustees is as follows. The best way for an attorney to get in touch with me is probably by email. My email address is h-m-m-o-r-r-i-s at wvtrustee.org. Uh, also, I try to make myself available at the 341s. I try to get to the meeting early so that if anybody has any questions, they can talk to me then. With my staff attorney and I have been trying to work with any attorney who wants to come to the office and just go over uh, procedures and uh, the uh, workup sheet that we do, which is an Excel workup sheet, and we give the attorneys a copy of that. It's also on the Northern District website. Uh, my my law firm is Amore Law, PLLC. I'm located at 206 West Liberty Street in Charlestown, West Virginia. Uh, my email is Aaron at amorelaw.com, and my assistant, Ann, uh, who handles all of the trustee work, is Ann at amorelaw.com. Ann's contact uh, number would be 304-885-4971. I also have a Facebook account. If you were to search on Facebook, A-A-W-V-T, uh, it would come up, Aaron Amore, U.S. Bankruptcy Trustee. Uh, on that uh, Facebook page, I have a bunch of information, including the U.S. Trustee's information sheet, uh, some updated information, uh, the typical required uh, questions that the trustee is going to ask. Uh, the Facebook page also uh, provides uh, debtors with uh, as current information as possible with respect to weather-related cancellations. Uh, I have no control over uh, the cancellation of uh, uh, the docket, it's really up to the Berkeley County Courthouse. If it's open or not, I generally hear in the morning uh, and I post on the Facebook page whether or not the hearings are going or not so that debtors, uh, both pro se debtors and debtors who learn through their counsel, uh, can take a look at the Facebook page and see if the hearings are going or not. Oh, uh, they can call my office in Marksburg, 304 uh, 624 They can send me an email at thf. AAL at AOL.com. Um, they can, if they call the office, they can speak to uh, Betty Matheny or Linda Fluharty, who are both here all the time. If they need to get in touch with me and is scoring a meeting of creditors, they can call the clerk's office and the clerk will normally get uh, a message to me. My office uh, address is uh, 4115th Street. My telephone number is uh, 232 1064. And uh, uh, I maintain a website, and you can send uh, information to my paralegal at a website called Sheehan Paralegal at uh, wvdsl.net. And uh, so let me repeat that one, Sheehan Paralegal at wvdsl.net. Thank you for watching this brief overview. For further questions, please visit our website at www.wvnb.net wvnb.uscourts.gov. Thank you.